I'm Rob Lucuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, here with Emmy winner Pamela Adlon, creator, writer and director of Better Things. Um, Pamela, Better Things ends with this joyful, endearing farewell to the audience with the entire cast singing Monty Python's Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. I think it's perfect. I'm wondering why did you decide that you wanted to end it that way? Well, I had these, um, and thank you very much. Um, I had these two Eric Idle cues that I really wanted to, to use. I was, I was in love with the idea of using the Galaxy song in the first, the season premiere, and um, which, you, you know, if you read into it, there's so many layers and so many little things that we've embedded into the season that pay off later. And so, um, you know, Sam is, uh, you, it was my way kind of addressing like us coming back from COVID and not putting masks on everybody's faces and talking about it, you know, um, and uh, it just went hand in hand with always look on the bright side of life. Um, the galaxy song, you know, how we're all just little specks mm -hmm. in the universe and, you know, and we've become just really so, uh, kind of uh, in, insane, dangerously narcissistic uh, that um, it's, a, it's a way of uh, uh, changing your perspective in life. And so uh, I really wanted always look on the bright side of life as kind of a send off to um, uh, really the fans of the show, the people who've been with the show and with this family and this village and watching it and, um, you know, you see, you see Max and Phil are, you know, back in England and it's just really, um, uh, I, I like that. And I, I feel that I was able to kind of go there without it being too much or too yeah. cheesy. Cause you yeah. know, we kind of earned it a little bit. I was hoping. I so. Yeah. And the thing is, I, I said to you offline how I missed the show and that's because it so lived in and so authentic it just felt so immersive like we were kind of just going along with Sam and her journey right and uh I also wonder you know given that lived in quality how do you think you've grown as a director you've directed I think every episode from season two on um when you look back how what what would you say was the one takeaway that you really grew as a helmet with in, in the director's chair it was really about, you know, for me at, at off the top, it was about the ability to make decisions and, um, you know, and I remember my first AD Maria Mantia um, season one, she said that is going to get you so far just being able to make decisions because it makes everybody's job easier. And uh, you know, learning and growing and growing these muscles, and um, you know, what what I do and what I love are the things that I poured into the way I wanted the show to look, feel, sound. You know, I I, I was able to incorporate all the things that are aesthetically pleasing to me um, into the show. And then try things that I always wanted, like uh, and learning about like the camera package and knowing that I always want a split diopter, but you have to ask for it earlier. And then wow. um, not getting too um, caught up in things like toys and lenses because I know that that's not my thing. That's like Danny's thing. You know, it's it's something that I'm learning as I go, but I know that my strengths lie in what's in that frame and yeah. I, the way I want it to look and what I can do and give to the actors and for, and for myself. And um, th that's the biggest thing, you know, when, you know, for me being an actor my whole life, it was anathema to me. I would never want to tell an actor what to do. 
you know, because yeah. when I was 19, I was doing a play and I said to this one guy, I said, you know, can you just push the shopping cart faster? They're going to see the, the severed head in the shopping cart. And he just looked at me and he screamed, nobody tells me how to act. And he threw a chair at me and I was like, I will never tell an actor what to do again. And then I became a director and I was like, I had to. And so it was like baby steps for me about um, things that I could share. And as an actor, having that sensitivity. Yeah. And so if I have a direction or something for an actor, I would never yell it across a room. I would always even though I'm in it and directing it, I would just go over to them and say, I have something for you. And then it feels like it's not, you don't have to get defensive or, or what have wow. you, you know? That is fascinating. I hear that a lot from actors who then move on to directing, that sensitivity, that empathy, because of your familiarity and your experience um, on that side of the camera. And I, I think people maybe forget that because you're you're a performer and you're so well known for your writing that you've you've done so much directing on this show. It's really a lot of this is your vision. There's one thing in particular that I've really loved about season five, and in fact the whole show, it's how you frame certain scenes and build them. You use you use really interesting things like FaceTime, black and white still photography, the GoPro, for example. Um, they're not gimmicky though. They feel really organic. Again, everything we do with Sam feels lived in. Yep. Um, and also because that's how we curate our own lives with photography, GoPros, FaceTime. What attracts you to mixing it up on the show so that it can be taken in by the audience in a different way? Well, I, I that's how I became a filmmaker because I, you know, when I talk about like the the trajectory of my career, I, I say to people, don't be so myopic, do other things. You don't have to just sit there like as an actor and wait for the phone to, to ring, um, you know, as a director, you know, make yourself available in other ways and innovations. And so um, I had been uh, recording things and filming things my whole life. So uh, since I got my first cassette recorder when I was 11, where you press play and record at the same time, and I would read cookbooks into the recorder. And then, you know, when I got a Super 8 camera and when I learned how to develop my own film, and then I shot um, my first, uh, uh, film, which was a documentary on 16 millimeter, and I cut it on 16, and um, it, you, you, and I was writing songs, and I was, uh, um, and just I had a camera in my hand for about 15 solid years, and I photographed everything, and I recorded everything, and so those are mediums that I'm comfortable with, and I'm a very analog person, and so putting that into the show. Uh, was a natural progression yeah. for me. Yeah, it, it felt that way. Um, the show's tone as well is really unique. It's often really funny, but it's sometimes quite bittersweet and even melancholy. Uh, I think that's what attracts uh, fans to, to the show. It just feels really real and raw. Um, what's the key though to unlock the right tone? Because too broad and it diminishes the emotion underpinning Sam's story too serious and then it's no longer really a comedy so how do you navigate that uh, that's a really good question i just think that you allow those feelings and uh you know i learned a lot about writing uh from you know being on king of the hill which was yeah. an animated show that um the writing to me was extraordinary and i've learned the most by anybody who allows air to live in moments in scenes and i love uncomfortable moments that can you know like i say to the actors just let it sit there like a fart don't try to fill in the blanks it's okay we can handle it let's let the discomfort set in um yeah. because actors always feel like they have to like do a little boop 
you know, at the end, yes. of the thing, it's just like, everybody relax. It's going to be okay. And so, you know, th there's definitely a balance. Like I love, I love the spaces in between. And I feel like we kind of killed ourselves with all the black and white the extremes in terms of everything and yeah. that you know it's the in between that um this world certainly in this show that's where it, it lives and that's it does. that's getting kicked in the in the teeth and that's getting you know kissed on the the fanny you know what i mean <laughs> in the same moment maybe yeah it's the same thing um, Pamela, I wish we had all day. Unfortunately, we don't. Thank you for such a great series. We're going to bring you back for our group chat shortly. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. I'm Rob Lacuria, Senior Editor at God Debbie here with Roxy She, Director of List of a Lifetime. Um, Roxy, this film written by Jessica Landry hits home for so many people on a really profoundly personal level. Yeah. Um, is that one of the reasons why you really wanted to direct it? Yeah, you know, um, I was I was really burnt out when I read this script. I was like doing a series of jobs. And when a producer friend of mine, Autumn Federici, gave me this script, I just thought, oh my God, it's the end of the year. I want to go on holiday. You know, she goes, seriously, just give it some of your time. Just like read the first 15 to 20 pages. And um, I think a lot of filmmakers know that, and actors know that it, when you read the first 15 to 20 pages of a script and it immediately hooks you, like there's something about the script, about the dialogue, about the language, about these people that just hooks you. Um, I called her, like I wasn't even halfway done with the script and I was like, I wanna do this movie. Like there's so many elements of this that are so important. Um, we all knew um, or have lost someone through breast cancer um, in my community, you know, in the Pan-Asian community, we don't really talk about this. It's kind of taboo. Like my aunt recently went through it. Barely any of it was talked about and it just creates a feeling of isolation um, when people don't share their experiences, right? And then on another level, the fact that it's AAPI represented was just so important to me. And um, it was just an immediate yes. So everything about this little movie we call it our little miracle movie, has continued to show us that, um, you know, stories like this have no bounds and need to be told. And mm -hmm. it's been just miraculous to be on this journey. Also, can I just say, like, I'm so honored to be on this panel. Like, I am fangirling because I'm like fans of all of these filmmakers on this panel. <laughs> yeah. So it's like such an incredible honor to be here. Um, so thank you, Colter, for having me. Yeah. Of course, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, when, you, when you're going to watch a movie about somebody who's suffering with breast cancer or any cancer or any affliction and illness, and then, you know, there's also the whole uh, angle about adoption and finding your long lost daughter. This could go in some very different directions. It could have been really mawkish. It could have been really overly sentimental. Um, this wasn't. I just, uh, yeah, I, I'm not that I, I don't mean to sound surprised, but I just love the way you navigate this so nuanced and it's really touching. Um, did it, did you, was there a lot of your own person, like how did it resonate with you personally for you to make it feel so intimate and feel so authentic? One of the themes that I've been really pulled towards, especially as I'm in my mid thirties now is the relationship between mother and daughter. And um, there's so much that goes in, into those relationships that I feel like I need to reconcile in my own way. So for me, you know, um, Talia has two mothers, you know, her adoptive mother and also her biological mother. And there's so much that is unsaid with such a short amount of time to find that closure, context and understanding. And so with that framework, it was just amazing to be able to work with Sylvia and Kelly Hu and Shannon Doherty and really combine our experiences and what we hope to explore within these women. And so it wasn't just me, I think, you know, as a director, I feel like so sometimes, most of the time, I don't have all the details, but I do have a general direction. And I think as long as we all move towards that general direction and we're all on the same page towards that path, what you can find could be so beautiful, right? And Shannon's currently still surviving with yeah. 
came back. So she's stage four right now, but, you know, she directed our special content, you know, she was an amazing example. She's thriving, you know what I mean? Like she's showing that you can live this without fear and, you know, live your life by your own choice. And that's important to represent as well. Yeah, I am um, immediately when I saw that Shannon was attached to this and, and actually co-starring in it, it added another dimension because we all know what she's going through personally as well. Um, you mentioned the representation. It, it sounds cliche to ask about Asian representation, representation about Asian Pacific Islander people, but I think it's um, I, I think it's so important. And um, this could have been about anyone any, from any background, but the fact that you know you're a woman of Asian descent making a film about a woman of Asian descent. Um, what does that mean to you? How much do you value being able to spotlight that story? Well, it starts with Kelly Hu because like when I was growing up, I watched her in martial law, you know, like yeah. the X-Men and, um, you know, I'm an immigrant. So I came to the States when I was six and, you know, watching her on TV, you know, and Samuel Hung and being able to see her being so amazing kick ass. And like the fact that she's in my movie as my lead and the fact that she says, Rox, I don't get movies like this. You know, I've been portrayed as a sex icon forever and we're all different people we all experience we have universal things that connect us and she brought so much to this like she said you know in previous panels that she's done the most research for this. she wants to honor the women that have gone through this she wants to represent you know the pan-asian community as well um it's so important because in a way i'm making these movies for my younger self yeah right like every time that I pitch something every time that I'm fighting for something that I'm coming in with an honest perspective because that is my own. That is what I know, you know, and everybody else adds a little bit of seasoning to the dish, you know, and we all season this main course that is the movie, which is the script, but like I can only offer my insight and my sensitivity. I grew up in three different countries. I've always felt like an outsider, but, um, and I know what that feels like. So being able to see you know, especially now as things are changing in TV and, and films, I'm so excited for what's coming. And I couldn't be prouder to be a filmmaker, you know, I'm just honored to be here. Yeah, oh, I, I hear you. I swear to God, I looked up on my phone. Is that the Kelly Who? And yes. Like, yeah, that's Kelly Who. Queen Kelly. Wow. She's so different. She's in this movie. She's so fragile. She, like, I'll give you a great example. And this is, this is testament to your work, Roxy. The film opens with a devastating cancer diagnosis, right? And I'm telling you like as if you don't know, but this is my, <laughs> this is my perspective, right? <laughs> Kelly, whose performance, uh, breathtaking, and then the overall narrative are unsettling, but I love how you framed it, the magnitude of what she's going through. She's tiny in this huge frame. And then uh, so that, you know, when she's being told about the diagnosis, it's, it's a gut punch. And um, so Brenda Lee's just sitting there stunned in the middle of the frame, surrounded by space, alone. She's small, overwhelmed. And then the editing goes back and forth between her and the doctor, untethered by anything else in the room. It's just bang, bang. bang. And it's, I found that so unsettling. Thank you. And I just really want you to talk me through, you're making these intentional choices that we perhaps don't quite get when we're watching them because we're in the moment. But I mean, talk me through those intentional choices that you make with framing. And then of course, with your contribution to what the editor is doing. Robert, I appreciate that so much. Like honestly, um, cinema language and perspective of the character is what drives, you know, the whole visual language forward and, and the growth, right? Like all of this is subtle and something that you collaborate with your cinematographer in. And for me and Kelly, we really describe how like, how she feels so isolated, she feels so small. By the way, it's not easy to make Kelly Fu look ugly or, no. or unattractive by any means. Like you could roll her in like a pile of dirt down an avalanche, avalanche of snow, not dirt. But anyways, you could roll her down something and she'll look like a goddess, like no matter what. But also I had Daphne Wu, who is a Chinese American cinematographer, who is one of my closest friends. And she is just so dedicated, like in the way that we portray these stories, like everything must be done with sensitivity. Are you, whose perspective are you seeing the scene from? How do they feel? You know, what do they not understand? What is not being said? Because it's all about the spaces between the dialogue that we really learn about a character, right? And so my kink is always blocking because 
because blocking you can you could stage any scene like like master coverage coverage right okay fine you get coverage but in, in terms of the blocking like what is what is their what you could tell so much by the dynamic of how they move around each other right so this is why I love like working with cinematographer is that language of these characters and how they interact physically. And that will determine what's not being said. So, and then if you choose to think about like, well, whose perspective are we in? And how are we, you know, the scene with Talia and, um, and Brenda, like the dumpling scene as they make their way towards each other at the end, you know, there are moments when it's just about Talia learning, then it becomes all about Kelly as she goes into her I mean, Brenda, you know, her yeah. trauma. And then in the end, you they share that space together where they're level together. All of this is, you know, done subconsciously by the filmmaker in order to create that sort of emotional impact that we wish that audiences can receive. And I'm glad that I've done somewhat, <laughs> that's done yeah. somewhat well on this. So I appreciate you um, telling me that. Yeah, I, it was really enjoyable and enjoyable maybe, uh, I, you know what I mean? Cause it's a sad, it's a sad film, but it's so beautiful at the end and it's got a lot of heart. And on that note, Roxy, unfortunately we wish we had more time, but we're going to bring you back for our group chat so we could talk some more. Thanks so much, Robert. Thank you. I'm Rob Lucuria, senior editor at God JV here with Jennifer Getzinger, director on Outer Range. Jennifer, you directed episodes three and four of this bonkers, riveting, <laughs> Uh, sci-fi neo western it just so it's genre bending just like it's time bending um talk us through why you took on these two episodes and what it's like to take the reins or the baton from some you know so to speak from some an, another director to continue and expand on the show creator's vision um, yeah, well, it was really interesting because I did episodes three and four, which is technically the second block that shoots, you know, so they were shooting the first two episodes and then I did my two episodes. But, you know, the show was still very much in, in, in its uh, infancy. So it was a great time actually to be able to just dig into the material and sort of find the visual language. You know, we were still really uh, searching for that. And, um, you know, Brian Watkins was really had a lot of amazing um, references to all kinds of like Westerns and uh, Coen Brothers and just all kinds of interesting things that he was referencing um, that we ended up, you know, using a lot of that kind of language in how we shot the episodes. And so um, I think, you know, I was trying to build on what the first block did, but then also just keep expanding, you know, how we could tell this story. So then how do you tackle this? Did you primarily tackle it as a, a neo-Western? Did you primarily tackle it as a sci-fi thriller? Or did the genre not particularly matter to you at the end of the day? Um, well, it did matter in that. I think the Western element was definitely very important, especially because I did early episodes. And I think we really wanted to like, show, you know, show that landscape, show this world, show the ranch, show their lives. You know, there's a lot of where you really see what they do and you see them being ranchers and you really establish the family and their home um, because the ranch is like another character, you know? So we really needed to lean into the Western um, in that sense. But then of course, whenever we did go to um, the more sci-fi elements, you know, that's where we could use a little bit of a different type of, of visual language. You know, we actually put a lot more movement in, it was a lot more like um, dreamy, I would say, or, you know, something where you're just not sure what's real. Whereas I think all the things at the ranch were more like grounded and, and more, um, you know, that kind of visual language where it was a yeah. much more uh, tableau. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, tableau. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And I noticed that quite a bit. However, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, but I noticed in episodes three and four, there's some really innovative blocking that you do internally. So this beautiful light and shade in the bar with Perry mm -hmm. and Autumn, I found that to be so, it, it was just so immersive. I don't mm -hmm. understand how you and the DP were able to achieve that so effectively. And also in the jail cell between Joy and Rhett in episode four, even where active sheriff you know, Joy is trying to catch Royal or, or um, Rhett in a lie about the body. And there's a whole bunch of, there's some very, really effective editing in that as well. And I think you, the editor and the cinematographer were able to achieve something really special in those internal scenes. What were you, what was the intention behind those? Um, yeah, well, we, um, we were definitely going for a sort of, 
isolating each character in their space, you know, and I think that sometimes we did that with this quick editing where you're going between you don't you're not even sure which room you're in or who she's talking to at times when we were getting, you know, uh, in that interrogation sequence, we wanted to sort of have you feel what it would be like and have you get as confused as they would get in trying to keep up with their lies and you know that kind of thing but we liked you know everybody was sort of in their own boxes you know and we would jump around but then we did that a similar thing with lighting in like the bar where we had you know perry and autumn were kind of very we kept them really separate and we did that more with lighting than with how we shot it um drew daniels the dp is really really talented and really um I thought did an amazing job of, the, of those kinds of things. Um, the other one that you referenced was, um, oh, when Joy is questioning, um, questioning Rhett in the jail cell. And that also yeah. was, you know, again, we just wanted you to feel as sort of closed in as he did. So a lot of it was shooting through, um, you know, the grading of the set of the cell, looking down on him, really yeah. trying to feel like you're pinned in the corner like Rhett is. I love that because obviously the performance of the script is already making us uh, feel tension, but mm -hmm. the way that you're able to block that and, and shoot it made me feel very unsettled. So oh, well done, <laughs> that's the whole point. Um, uh, episode three, the, the first episode you tackled, uh, uh, takes us through these profound moments in the evolution of, of Earth and the human mm -hmm. race. And then it ends with, and the land and the sky didn't give two shits. I loved that. It's so <laughs> perfect for this show. What's it like when you get a script which opens on something so ambitious that you have to deliver it and bring it to life? Well, I mean, I love, you know, again, being some of the earlier episodes, there was a lot of setting up just the mythology of this world and sort of what what the land felt. You know, that was that was sort of what I was talking about, about how the ranch itself was its own character and you got to kind of hear what the land would think. And it also was a great uh, foreshadowing of of time and how you know and what how much time was going to mean in the story um because it showed how um how the land changed in time and obviously we learned later about how that affected the different characters but um yeah i mean that was the kind of thing where that was working more with visual effects um people you know who had they they had done some of it there was a lot of you know they basically come to you like with sort of a okay here's the base of like the different kind of looks we could have and then you and then a lot of it is figuring out okay how do we get from one look to the other as far as how this landscape changes and how you know are we going to have it what is it going to be cut quickly you know we tried a few different things but i thought that the way we ended up landing on it kind of morphing from one thing to the next was felt like the most natural yeah it's Highly entertaining. I did not see that coming. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it does explain quite a lot, actually, once you get further into the show. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the actors, you, you get to do some really great stuff, but I must bring up Will Patton um, as the Tillerson patriarch. <laughs> he does some crazy stuff in these episodes. He dances with the mysterious rock. He cries uncontrollably, obviously, when he learns of his son's death. Mm -hmm. And then he drives to the void in a frenzy where he ultimately ends up in a confrontation with, of course, the most imposing character of all, Royal. But do you enjoy working with these larger than life actors? Because Will Patton is a legend and he dominates the screen. How, what, how did you feel about working with him? Oh, I mean, Will was amazing. He was really amazing. I had never worked with him before. And, you know, he came in and he just was really like, he was so into the script. He was so into this character. He just really felt like he understood this guy as crazy as he was. There was like something deep in him that he like really like loved about this man. And, um, and you know, if anything, I feel like an actor like that, I, I felt like my job was just to like protect him, you know, I mean, which is often the, the job, right, of, of just letting him know, yeah, you can go even, you know, even push it, even go another step farther. I mean, and he was so bold that he would do it, you know, I mean, I think that he was really um, like, especially with the crying scene about um, you know, he was kind of nervous about that scene, but I think just because he plays things so in such a real visceral way, you know, and so it was really just about encouraging him to just really, you know, you can't be too devastated by this news. I mean, it's really just the worst thing you could ever hear. And, and he, I mean, it's just amazing how vulnerable he can be on screen. It's really, I was very impressed with uh, everything yeah, he did. 
You know, it reminds me as well, sort of really my final question. It's something that I'm really honestly curious about with directors. When you're directing and working with more seasoned actors and those actors that have been around for decades, people who know what they're doing, like Josh and, and Will mm -hmm. and Lily, and there's, you know, they, they know their way around the set. What's the key for you? In, are they all different or do you seem to have a certain style with younger direct, uh, uh, actors who who need the guidance and the older ones who perhaps you need to be a bit more careful with the way that you're giving them notes and the way that you're directing them? Um, there definitely is a difference. Um, and, and in this show, we had both. We had some newer, you know, younger, newer actors. And we and then, of course, yeah, we had Josh and Lily and, and Will and um, people like that. Um, I, th I think I do approach it a little bit differently, um, but there isn't really a one size fits all. You know, everybody kind of has their own style and that's always something you're figuring out the first day or two that you're working with them. Um, you know, something I love about doing first season shows is that we're all still finding these characters and finding this world. And so often, you know, I feel like the best actors are always still very open to finding ways of showing who this person is or ways of digging into something a little bit deeper. And, you know, Josh and Lily were both very, um, had really studied these people, had really like really crawled, you know, crawled into their skin, were really inhabiting them, but yet they were still very open to maybe I would do this, maybe I would do that, maybe I would have this kind of react, you know, that they really wanted to just explore and sort of find the, the, the right boundaries for these characters, you know, so it was really exciting. I mean, um, you know, and in that, I think, uh, again, it's just a lot of that kind of thing is, um, is being the person who can be on the outside of that watching and saying, yes, that's working. That's, you know what I mean? And that kind of stuff and encouraging them and then, and then encouraging them to try something else and go in a different way. And, and to me, that's the most exciting time of directing is when actors are open to that kind of uh, exploration. Okay, okay. Yeah, and of course, like, you know, if you're a director on a, on a film and it's, you know, your film, you wrote it or whatever, I think it's a completely different thing to a director coming in on a series, mm -hmm. you've got a block of episodes, and you have to be the leader, but you, I'm saying, I mean, imagine if you weren't a people person and you weren't able to actually <laughs> interact with these people, it would be a nightmare, wouldn't it? Right, right. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> anyway, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today uh, and good luck in your future work. I look forward to perhaps hopefully seeing you on the Emmy Red Carpet one day soon. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, here with Oscar winner Danny Boyle, Director of Pistol. Um, Danny, Pistol attempts to tell the story, fascinating origin story of the Sex Pistols, it's one that I wasn't really that familiar. I mean, obviously I was familiar with the band, but I didn't really know about their origins. Um, and it's just one of the greatest bands of all time in terms of their influence. So why did you want to bring this to life as a limited series? I think uh, it's very personal uh, for me because I'm, I'm the exact same age as the group. So when they were starting off as, you know, like late teens, early twenties, I, I was the exact contemporary of them. And so they, the part they played for me in my life was obviously musically, it's like any group, you know, for you know, your favorite group or whatever at the time. But they represented smile. They broke in in Britain. Um, and, it, and, it was, and it was expressed in popular terms through their um, profanity towards the Queen and the Jubilee as well then in 1977. But actually, it was something much greater than that, um, which is that if you came from a background like I came from and they came exact same a working class background, you, your prospects were very, very limited. And that is very difficult to explain to a mob of how limited your horizons were. In fact, the way I tried to explain it to the actors was that it felt like your life was timed, that you were young and then you were old and there was nothing in wow. What they did was they kind of interrupted that, they smashed that, and not in a particularly constructive way, in a chaotic, almost destructive way, and they speak about destruction, but the value of it was it gave you the opportunity to say, there is something in between that. You don't have to follow your father's, put your shoes on and follow him into the factory or into prison or wherever, because Steve, character of is a thief clearly at the beginning 
um, that there was something else that you could celebrate something else in your life. And it didn't have to be, this is the true bit. If you wanted to waste your life, if that was it, you could waste it. Be futile, be vacant, be pretty vacant, as they say. Um, but the was yours. It's the timelessness yeah. that there was something in between. And it's interesting looking back now. And we have done nothing else since but celebrate that time in between, to become greater and greater. The distance between being young and being old. We all live for as long as possible. And yeah. they were responsible for that. Punk, I think punk was the force that changed that, you know? So it was that really. And also just very simply, somebody very famous, I think said, uh, without music, life is a mistake. And I've always believed that. I mean, it's just, it has to be part, it's such a huge part for me of my life. So speaking about music, Danny, I think like, you know, music supervision, working with the music supervisor as a filmmaker, I mean, when I think back on Danny Boyle Productions, so much of it is about the needle drops and how you were able to meld them into the narrative. So as a filmmaker, what is it about music and needle drops that elevates the narrative as it does? I think it's because you, I, I mean, I'm sure there were other people responsible for it, but in, in my memory, it was Scorsese who was principally responsible for bringing it to a mainstream audience, which is that you would, the, the normal principle is to hide music, is that it works invisibly on you. It, it affects you in the story. You don't realise you're being manipulated by music, but needle drops are different because they declare this is a pop song, which you probably already know and have a relationship with. So it's gonna work with the narrative that you're watching in two ways. It's obviously the character's relationship, the reason it's in the scene, whether it's because they're in a pub or because it's a particular action sequence or comedy sequence or whatever it is. But then you've got your own relationship with the music as well. So it's kind of doubly impacting. And um, I think I kind of got addicted to it. And I remember when we put out, when we put out Train Spotting, yeah. there were a lot of people, especially in Britain, thought it was very MTV. And I remember thinking, oh, I really like MT. Um, okay. <laughs> what's wrong with that? <laughs> but I think it was because it wasn't classical. But that's the punk. It's what I was saying previously about punk is that that's the instinct, which is to don't be afraid to step in where others tell you you're not qualified to. You know, that you, if you've got something to say, say it. But, um, and that's a, it's a very simple thing from, from that's, it's certainly shaped my life anyway. And certainly the way I, um, the way I make films, yeah. The music being a huge part of them, like you say. Oh, totally. Um, okay, so the first episode opens with clips of conservative high society, the royal family, and other turning points in the 70s, right, in the UK, against the strum of an electric guitar. So it starts getting us excited about what's to come. We see glimpses of Bowie, of course, uh, and then Richard breaks into the Odeon, steals equipment. To me, that whole opening sequence is an ultimate FU to the establishment, to the status quo. Talk us through putting that sequence together because um, it's so vital. If you don't hook the audience, it's possible they may not stick with you for the whole entire series. Yeah, well, I hope they do, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, it, um, I think if you're British, really, everything starts with Bowie. And yeah. of course, He's, he's on stage, this is a very famous concert, actually recorded by Pennebaker. And, um, and, and interestingly, Steve Jones, who's the main character in it, who goes on to become the guitarist with the Sex Pistols, he's, he lived uh, around that area. And he used to go stealing from this um, concert hall, uh, especially if they, left quit, if they were doing two nights and they left equipment there. He would break into the um, Hammersmith Apollo and actually steal equipment. He'd steal guitars, speakers, anything he could get his hands on. And of course, that's a wonderful metaphor to start with, really, that you break in and steal the equipment of David Bowie, so that you're kind of in hurry, so you're paying your dues to David Bowie, and but you're taking on, you're taking it on from him, really. So that was why we wanted to start it like that, really. And then they end up in this motor car, evading the police, and it's sort of, they're scallywags, really. You know, it's fairly innocuous uh, yeah. crime, but they are individuals and they speak for themselves. I love that about it. You know, they kind of, um, they don't really care what you think of them. Um, and that's a very important part of punk because one of the manipulations is people, particularly at that time, were telling people they weren't qualified for this, they weren't allowed to do this, 
they weren't allowed to contribute this, you must be respectful. And, um, and they were the ultimate disrespectful. They respected nothing. Um, yeah. And out of it was born this album, Never Mind the Bollocks. And in the, t in the title itself, you can hear their, what, they, what they think about <laughs> conventional taste. Um, yeah, I love that. God bless them for it, yeah, Absolutely. rather than the Queen. Um, final question is, you, you, this has got a really intentional, specific um, choices in terms of the way it's framed and the way it's shot. It's got a beautiful retro aesthetic. You, you, the aspect ratio is more analog. Um, there's a lot of touches that I can see. I can see your fingerprints all over it, and it just feels really right and authentic for what we're watching. But talk me through briefly what was behind those choices and why did you want to do it that way? There's a wonderful, there's a wonderful documentary about them. By Ju one of our greatest filmmakers is British filmmakers is Julian Temple. He's a and it's his documentary work that signals him out as really truly world class. And he made a wonderful documentary about them called Filth and the Fury. And we inherited from that or stole from that, in a, to put it in a more punk phraseology, the kind of use of archive and to blend archive with uh, the world now. So we were trying to take people, um, you're trying to create a moment of truth in a, a, that you want people to believe is 1976, you know, without the need of a DeLorean device to get you back there. Um, and an archive is wonderful. And I, I think it was interesting hearing Pamela speak about different, earlier speaking about um, different formats and different cameras. That is such a part of people, everybody's lives. People are so visually articulate about what they're prepared to, um, what they're interested in visually. And, yeah. and, 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 and classicists would say, oh my God, God there's too much grain, you know, um, because cameras are all about eradicating grain and going for this 8K look or 16K look. But in fact, people's habits are, and people's lives are full of all photographs or videos. And so it was to try and just ferret around in that because you're dealing in memory and you're also dealing in present day as well at the same time. So it was trying to find a way of harnessing both those forces without you feeling either interrupted each other. Yeah, and, and without it being gimmicky, it just feels so immersive. I had so much fun watching this show. I wish you could make more. Um, Danny, thank you for your time. So we're going to bring you back shortly for our group chat. Thank you. I'm Rob Lacuri, a senior editor at Gold Derby, here with Gina prince Bythewood, director on Women, Women of the Movement. Um, Gina, you're a number of directors. You're one of a number of directors on this project to bring this show to life. Uh, you did the pilot, and I'm really honestly curious about how you, what, what are the challenges of taking the reins for the first episode, doing all the world building with the create, show's creator and writer, um, and then having to hand off the baton to somebody else when you're done? Um, I mean, I, I love the world building part of it. Um, I love establishing it, um, setting the tone. And uh, MJ, Marissa Joe, who created the show, we were very intentional on who were those other directors going to be. Um, and all three of them, Tina Marbury, Julie Dash, and Casey Lemons, um, we know them, they're all black women. We felt that we knew they would bring just that extra thing to the story, given it's Mamie Till's story and a woman who lost her son. Um, and so it was, of course, it's always hard to, to give something up, but we gave it to people that we trusted. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, obviously. Um, how horrifying to hand it off to someone that you don't trust. That <laughs> would be very bad organising. Um, so you take on the project like this about Mamie Till. It's a really fascinating story. It's devastating, actually, to, to, um, to witness. So what's your personal reaction to a story like that when you first become involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this, you know, this uh, story was one I had to do. That's kind of how I guide my decisions. There's so much stuff I want to do, but what do I have to do? And this was it. This is a story. The story of Emmett Till and, and his murder was a story that we've shared with uh, my sons. I have two boys. Um, when they were little, they knew about the story. It's such a horrifying story of America. Um, and the fact that it's continued to be perpetuated today so we felt like here we have this ability to tell the story that is still horrifyingly timely in this in this day and age. We didn't want to make it feel like a museum piece. 
we wanted people to be able to feel the urgency uh, of the story as well today. Um, I think the hardest thing about telling the story is given the amount of research that, that I think we all do in taking on a project like this, is that every time I read the story, every time I did the research, the ending didn't change. You know, as filmmakers, oftentimes we're working in narrative and you get to create the ending, you know, you get to create the story and where a character goes and how they behave. And in this case, Carolyn Bryant, this woman who, who lied about this 14 year old boy and what he did, which led to his murder, I, her actions never changed. These men's actions never changed. And it was just a striking thing to every day have to reflect on that. But it absolutely drove our, just our work every day that we had to get this right. Yeah, absolutely. Um... When I first started watching it, and I, I watched the whole thing in a, in a few days, you can't mm. binge this, by the way, people watching this. This is something you need to savor slowly if you haven't seen it yet. Um, so you set up Mississippi in the 1950s, and I would imagine that's probably not easy to get completely right. I mean, it's been done before, but I found it, I felt a real sense of place and time really come through the screen so authentically and immersively in this one. I really did. Was that difficult to accomplish? Well, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, it was really important to show the difference between Chicago at that time and Mississippi. Um, this, this place that this 14 year old boy was raised in, in, on, in neighborhoods that built him up and made him feel special to then go to Mississippi where the complete opposite, where he's told that he's got to keep his head down and walk off the sidewalk if a white person is walking toward him, all these rules. So, um, but also I didn't want to make Mississippi this, I wanted to be true to what it was. It's a beautiful state, um, but underneath that beauty is something so ugly and so violent. Um, so it really was playing with color was a big thing that our DP, Tammy Riker, was amazing, um, that she and I talked about of just in Chicago, letting these colors, the natural colors pop, but in Mississippi, um, being able to kind of pull all that out because there was such a lack of heart and soul within Mississippi at that time. So how do we do that organically so that it doesn't feel, um, you know, doesn't feel fake. And we were able to do it really through production design and costume, which is the way, you know, I like to do in terms of when I'm playing with color like that. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I started watching the show, I started reading about it as well because I familiarized myself with the story. And I thought, I wonder how Jean is going to tackle when the mum finds out about what's happened. Um, so it's it, we talk about we talk about blocking with directors a lot, and in this one, it's very it's pretty straightforward. She's on the phone, she's in the middle of the frame, um, and it's just on her, and we just wait for the reaction. It is so powerful. You could have made it really bombastic and really you know overly sentimental if you wanted to and that would have been fine why did you decide to do that in that way it's it's you know as a director it's so fun to listen to um the other directors talk about um their process and what they bring to it and and about blocking and the importance of that i mean we as directors we control where a where an audience looks and oftentimes what an audience feels and for this my approach to the whole thing was really strip away any type of tricks, um, just tell the story. I didn't want the camera to be a participant in this. Um, so it was, there was never gonna be any slow-mo. There was never gonna be any uh, dramatic camera moves. The camera's always at eye level um, because I wanted, I just wanted you to stay in it and feel like you're watching real life. It absolutely helps to have an actor like Adrian Warren who portrayed Mamie. And I knew at that point I had, we shot that towards the end of uh, the shoot and uh, such an enormous trust had been built up between us. And I knew that if I just stayed on her, she was gonna give me everything I needed. And I don't know, I, I remember just sitting behind the camera watching that, knowing that I just wanted to stay with her and um, you know, feel that, that uncomfortableness as, as Pamela talked about, make the audience feel uncomfortable as well. Because as you said, you're waiting to see her reaction. And uh, I just thought it was way more powerful to watch her as opposed to some dramatic push in where I'm manipulating the audience. I think the story in the moment dictated what I needed to do. 
It takes a lot of trust for a director um, with their, you know, their leading lady, their, their, the number one actor on the, on the series, a lot of trust to make sure that it comes off as you want it. Um, do you have to do a lot of, are you a director that does a lot of takes? Is it you a director that knows when you've got the take you want? Talk me through that process. It's funny, I'm sure I, I have one, uh, one answer and I'm sure my actors have another answer, but I like, well, I know in my gut when I've got to take. Absolutely. And as a director, I feel like I'm always chasing the perfect take. And when you get it, it is, I mean, that's why I do what I do. It's, it's an incredible feeling. Um, but I know what I want um, and I will keep going till I get it. But oftentimes I love getting it and then asking, you know, the actor, do you, do you want another take? This one's for you. Is there something else you want to show me? And I love as a director, again, I know what I want. But to be shown to see something I didn't even think about that may take it to a whole nother level, I love that. And again, that type of thing comes with trust in terms of what I've seen the actor, how deeply embedded they are in that character. And Adrian was so embedded in that character that, um, again, I, I knew that she would always give me the truth. And so, you know, for me, again, if you don't get it on set, it's not in the editing room. So I, I don't apologize if I end up taking a lot of takes um, because that's going to show up on screen. Yeah. And again, I think you said it right. You know what you want and and it's and come hell or high water, you, you need to get it to honor the material. Um, you know what's so weird? Last night I was having dinner, scrolling through my phone and I come across this article about how that barn in Mississippi is still there. Um, and the article is about how it's emblematic of America, particularly the South, perhaps not reckoning properly with their past. And given what's going on right now across the country, this emerging narrative in social media, political discourse about what we can teach kids at school, what we can talk about, what we can't talk about. Um, how do you feel that this show in particular sits within that whole narrative? And, are you hoping that people will give it a chance and watch it so they can understand what had happened? I feel, I think it's, it's so frightening how easily people forget um, what happened not that long ago. Um, and when you forget, then, you know, it keeps happening and we allow it to happen. Um, our hope was certainly that, that we could show the story and tell it authentically and in a way that anybody, even if you're not black, could watch this and empathize and feel what this mother went through, feel what this boy went through. And when you can empathize, then the hope is that you can identify and then change. Um, so that was absolutely the intent. Um, I think one of the saddest things about the story and shooting it is we actually shot it in Mississippi on purpose. We wanted to be there. Um, and as you said, a lot of the real locations are still there we walk through them with the actors and you feel it. You literally feel what happened, but there's a plaque dedicated to Emmett Till in Mississippi near the spot where he was murdered. They finally, I think it was just last year, finally had to like create a special kind of plastic around it because it kept getting shot up by people. That's still the mentality down there and what we were walking into to shoot this. And, and we felt that as well, there were some people in Mississippi that were happy that we were telling the story and there were others that were not happy that we were telling the story and you felt that um but again it just emboldened us to again tell the truth it's fascinating um gina thanks so much for your insight we're going to bring you back now for a group chat all right welcome to our meet the experts tv directors panel i'm rob lucaria senior editor at gold debbie and i am delighted to introduce our panelists today pamela adlon creator writer and director of better things Roxy She, director of List of a Lifetime, Danny Boyle, director of Pistol, and Gina Prince Bythewood, director on Women of the Movement. I am beside myself that I get to do a panel with people like yourselves. I'm such a fan. This is my first question, but I think this is really important for this day and age. We are living in a time when we talk about how amazing TV is. There's so much content. And it's so fantastic. But it's become, to quote Philip Masiak in Slate, physically unwatchable to anyone not permanently stationed in front of a screen clockwork orange style. And I honestly believe that, like, it's impossible. This is too much. 
it's so crowded, it's so chaotic. And good series, sometimes they fall through the cracks. Good films, they fall through the cracks. I'd love to know what you guys think of that, Get, making sure that your passion projects are seen and, and how much that means to you. Pamela, I'm coming to you first. So it's, it's kind of interesting because my show is about uh, the invisibility of, of being a middle-aged woman, you know? And so my show struggled with uh, being seen. And um, I know that it's, it's not a marathon and it's a race and, and it makes me, you know, I'm looking back at the five seasons. It, it makes me realize that um, people are going to discover the show because I worked extremely hard to make it evergreen mm. so that it wouldn't get dated and that the only time that you really know what time it's taking place is these, you know, yeah. and so um, it, it, it was a struggle and it was, it was hard because I would say, you know, why do people say they're hate watching this show and, and that, and like, we're right over here. We're great, you know, but there's, there's, there's so much to choose from. And uh, I mean, it, it, it's a struggle because there's so much content being put it put out that a lot of it's being diluted. So if you have a vending machine and you run out of the thing, you don't replenish that thing. You just put another thing in. It doesn't matter. And that's what I, I think that we're all talking about here is that what we're trying to make is something that matters and that will have uh, you know, a, a, a life that, that goes on beyond that. Yeah, 100%. Um, Danny, what do you think about that, this, this challenge that you have in this chaotic marketplace? I'm, I think I'm a bit, um, a bit, a lot older than everyone. So I've probably <laughs> been around a, a lot longer and I've been very lucky. I've had a couple of successes and, but I think you've got to, we're very lucky, all of us. I mean, listening to everyone, we all, we've all got a chance to make something. And there's a, there's a part of you has to be humble and you, you, you that doesn't affect the way you make it necessarily, but that when you wait for it to be received or, and I've had these as well, destroyed in front of your <laughs> eyes, that you have to accept that, you know, it's part, it's, and it's freedom, I'm afraid. It's like, you look at Putin now, he doesn't trust his audience that one little bit, he controls it completely and manipulates it and, mm. you know, and, it, and, it, and, and so you have to accept that that's a huge part of the equation that you're going to be judged and or and or even worse ignored um and that's part of it sometimes and you desperately work hard to you know make it as interesting as possible and it's the, and the more material that is made as your point as, as you're pointing out robert um then the harder you have to try to make yours relevant and important and um approachable and um but that you have to accept at some point that they are they are our judge and jury. Yeah, that is a great way to put it. Gina, do you agree? Like it's what's what's better being destroyed or criticized or being ignored? I mean, you want to be loved, but what if what if you're ignored? Um, I don't even want to answer that question. Like that, <laughs> that's the death knell to put something out and 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 just nothing that that would kill me. I mean, I feel like there is an incredible amount of content, but when you hear everybody here on, on this panel talking about their work that they're doing, the thing that is so clear is, you know, we're operating as we're our first audience and we're writing what we want to see. And when you do that, it's you're writing from a passion and from a specificity and from a special place. And we're telling stories that only we can tell. And that's what I continue and, and have to believe is what helps you stand out. Um, there is a lot of sameness out there and I just think about the things that excite me. It's it's when something is different. I mean, I know I'm referencing a film, but I literally, literally reference Slumdog Millionaire once a week. I mean, it is a film that is so important to how I feel about film and how you can be so culturally specific yet completely universal and why I love 
movies and why I love TV that again takes me into worlds that I don't know about or takes me into a character I don't know about and then you find out how much you identify with them and I think that all of our work um, certainly speaks to that. Absolutely. Ro Roxy, do you agree? You know, it's, I, you know, be, being in this time right now where there's so much oversaturation in content and with like internet content and like everyone just being in front of a camera and talking about something. Um, me, I, I know I'm like kind of outgoing, but it also scares me a lot, you know, but I think community is also very important. Like the film festival community, me and my Asian American community, I run a podcast called Two Horny Goats, you know, so it's just like <laughs> always like, it's not just storytelling in one way is, you know, directing, right? That's like one format of storytelling. But if you feel very passionate about something, if it just feels right to you, if it's what Gina said, like you are your audience, there's just this crazy feeling that it will end up in the hands of the right people. If you stand your ground and you're with the right producers, you're with the right studio, you're with this, you know, right production company, right network. You know what I'm saying? It's like they champion you, they'll market it in a way that you um, really believe that it's meant to be seen. People will hear that. I think people are a lot more open now. There's a lot of content, but also there's a lot of hope. You know, so I spread my message in many different ways, you know, whether it's going out to discussions, panels, showing up, you know, like I do that extra work because that's just how important the message is to me. But um, it, there is a lot of stuff out there, but I'm just grateful for the more doors opening and the opportunities that are happening for um, people. You that know, I, I want to, I just want to say something because you said, would you rather be ignored or vilified, which is so fucking interesting because yeah. right now the internet, you know, is like, people are like eating their own assholes. Like, and yeah. it's just about content and it's not about what you say. And so my dad was a writer and like he wrote, he wrote a movie called Venus Goddess of Love and Vanna White was in it in the eighties, okay? And it made the top 10 list of the worst movies of the week of like 1989 or whatever. And he was so happy. He was like, we've made a top 10 list. <laughs> So I just have to say that, like, my dad was an old dinosaur, like a, a, an original TV guy. So he was thrilled to be so hated because they talked about it. And it still exists because Vanna White was in it. Wow. Super main. I guess I just think that's everything, right? Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I just can't imagine you put your heart and soul into something. Just and This is for anybody in all professions. And then for it to be just dismissed would be yeah. devastating. Yeah. So speaking of, well, let's not dismiss something. Everybody, I think, because I'm a nerd, should have the favourite films and their favourite series just on standby in case the question is asked. I have them. I want to know about you guys, though. I don't care. No one is here to watch me. So, Roxy, favourite series or films, can be, can be plural, that you could watch over and over again that inspire you, that you love, that you hold dear to your heart. Over to you. Oh my gosh, I think everyone's gonna tell what type of person I am and what I like making just to make it <laughs> so So Okay, I have two shows and two movies. Okay, so shows, Squid Game is a game changer, obviously. Oh. Nina Warrior Princess, game changer. <laughs> You know, that lesbian, just love that. Just everything, little queer me, just want it. Okay, <laughs> moving on, movies. I will make this quick. Psycho and The Shining, um, obviously, oh genre buff, um, you know. Uh, I made the Bliss of the Lifetime was my first just straight drama. I've killed so many people, been very violent, you know, had the most sadistic ways of like killing off my characters in previous work. Um, so it's been kind of therapeutic to do something that was more, you know, emotionally driven than. Wow. Really? Getting my rage from previous generational trauma onto. Yeah. The Shining Psycho Squid Game. I mate and and Xena. Oh my yes. god, you're taking me back to when I was a kid. I know. I... One of the one of the most amazing New Zealand productions just across the Pacific where I am today. Um, yeah. yeah, they're good. They're really cool. Who'd like to go next? How about you, Gina? I think I think I have. A, we were talking about this offline, but regale us with your choices. That's my two my two uh, favorite TV shows from opposite sides of the spectrum. 
uh, My So-Called Life and The Wire. Um, two amazing shows, two completely different, yet I think at the core, they, they make me feel in such a deep way. Um, and in terms of film, and just because I, I don't like to follow instructions, I'm gonna throw out three, and that would be Broadcast News, which is a perfect movie. Yes, uh, yes! Goodfellas, Goodfellas also oh uh, a perfect movie, and Hoop Dreams. Um, oh. Those three, if it's ever on TV, I'm stopping and I'm watching the entire thing. Yeah. I love this. This is my favorite thing. Danny, go for it. Oh, um, Apocalypse Now, because oh, for me, Francis Ford Coppola, unlike, unlike all his contemporaries, Francis Ford Coppola is invisible. When he directs a film, he is invisible. And mm. it's the most difficult thing to do when you get to his level to be invisible. And he trusts character and story and spectacle. And yet you don't feel like you're watching some... Anyway, I, I'm, I, it, it leaves me speechless. As obviously you could talk about The Godfather. So Francis Ford Coppola and TV series. There was a TV series in Britain. I don't know whether you guys ever saw it. It, it, was, it, was, it was based on uh, the, 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 the horrors that Margaret Thatcher unleashed on Britain. And I know people from America and from Australia have a, a, a kind of mixed picture of her. But if you want a picture of what working class people thought of her, you should um, watch something called Boys from the Black Stuff by yeah. a great, great writer from Liverpool called Alan Bleasdale. And that is, that's a, for me, I don't know how it resonated around the world, but in British yeah. terms, it was a game changer. Working class life on screen. It, it's a bit like, for, for Gina, it's sort of like The Wire, except it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't drugs, it was jobs. You know, was the currency. Can you get one? Have you got one? What it does to you? I mean, that's a brilliant. I hope that they're, I, God, I hope they re release that one day. Wow. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to search that down. That sounds really interesting. Um, Pamela, what about you? Well, I, I mean, I'm not going to give you my ultimate favorite because that's, <laughs> but it's, you know, for me, it's, it's all that jazz. It's, She's got to have it. The original one was a huge influence on me. Um, Paris is Burning, which is a documentary. Um, these are the things that shaped me. Right, Roxy? I oh mean, my God, yes! I can't, you know, um, yeah. Wild Style and then uh, All the Godfathers. I, I agree with Gina about broadcast news. I, I like, I can't, you know, it's... Why would you pick anything new when all these movies exist yeah. today? You know, people are like sh shuffling through the the channels and it's it's just why? You know, unless it's these things on this round table, but <laughs> there's so much stuff that exists. Um uh you know, all the godfathers to me. I love all fucking three of them. Man, I just I could watch them till the cows come home. It's so fascinating what Danny said that Coppola disappears in Apocalypse Now. And I I went to college for one semester and I took Russian literature and I read Heart of Darkness. And then when I saw Apocalypse Now, like it kind of cracked my head open. All the Cassavetes movies, you know, Woman Under the Influence, Opening Night. Um, so you know, I, I love all, all, all of that stuff is huge to me. And then, you know, in TV series, mine would be the Sopranos and the Jeffersons, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, those are, those are the things that, you know, I just remember like, um, you know, and weirdly enough, I was on the Jeffersons and my dad wrote an episode of the Jeffersons, wow. uh, which is crazy, but the, all the Norman Lear shows really shaped me as, uh, you know, somebody who consumes and loves television and now gets to make it. Um, yeah. Wow. yeah can I, I just want to throw out one thing, given we've all, as Pamela said, dipped into the past. I will say uh, I have to give a shout to to I May Destroy You. That, oh my God. that series oh was my, a game oh changer. Um, Which one? You know I may, I may destroy, destroy you. you. Oh. oh, incredible! Yes. I, I, had, I couldn't believe how good it was. Like, Change the game. So yeah. good. 
Yeah, so you're that, that's in my box. More intimately now, like now, now that I know everyone's like favorite show and yeah, TV. Yeah, baby. Robert, what are yours? Robert. One. Yeah, Rob. Yeah. When I was 11 years old, I saw Silence of the Lambs in the cinema with this girl that I had a crush on and kept holding onto her arm, pretending that I was scared, but I kind of was, but it was my way of just maybe getting some 11 year old action. And, um, but that's, we'll, we'll ne- I'll never forget that. Uh, but, and I can't believe my parents let me see that when I was 11, but I've seen that film maybe a hundred times and I get something out of it every time. Yeah. Anthony Hopkins is my idol. The Godfathers, I'm a Sicilian man, right? That's my background, so it's everything to me. And then Interstellar makes me cry profusely. Totally! But, oh, God. <laughs> Just, I forgot all the science fiction the science shit fiction that I'm obsessed arrival, with. Science <laughs> fiction, arrival, Interstellar, like... Also, all the horror, like, and yes. all the Korean cinema, all the oh. Asian cinema... Oh my Speaking god! Of, I'm Korean. I what when Parasite just came out a couple of years ago, and I just think that is just a, a masterpiece. And then, of course, for TV, The Sopranos, as Pamela mentioned, and um, and maybe it's not cool anymore to say this, but my sister and I can recite whole episodes of Roseanne to each other. Um, that's how we bond. <laughs> yeah, I just Roseanne think that show really is good. the best. I can recite the whole the whole fame, the oh. movie fame, and the Wiz. Wow. <laughs> I know them both by fucking heart because wow. I, you know, because you guys, I don't know if you remember Danny, I would have a, v, a VHS and I would stop it and I would take out a, a notebook and I would be <laughs> succulent and divine, delicious and nutritious. Brother Crows, this is good stuff here. I got it all forever. Yep. I, wow. I used to t- tape, get a tape recorder, big, one of those big ones with the buttons and put it next to the screen and just be like. Exactly. Um, <laughs> that's how we, that's how we roll. And yeah. Yeah. man. See what, see what, this is how you get to know people when you ask this question. And <laughs> I just thank you so much for your honest answers and especially for your insight. I've had such a ball this week watching your beautiful shows and films. And I'm so glad you put it out there. And thank you very much for your time today. It's really honestly appreciated. Well, thank yes. you. Thank you for bringing thank us together. Thank you so much. This was yeah. fun. Very nice to meet everyone.